for you guys. Uh, it's also the only place that was close enough for me to drive. We're rolling. Okay. All right. So I'll I'll get into it. I'm as I said, I'm I'm here to talk about talk about teaching evil. Um, and so you're probably wondering what what on earth do I mean by teaching evil? And of course, from the title of the talk, you're probably going to guess that I'm just talking about offensive security training. But that's not quite it. The topic is a little bit different. What I'm really talking about is a motivational strategy for raising awareness about informational security. And yes, my slides are all this gimmicky. I'm one of those guys. So hopefully we can all agree that awareness is important. In fact, according to all the reports that keep coming out, and including this one from ISACA from just last year, the most prevalent successful attack types continue to hinge on the human factor. I'm not even going to bother showing any more supporting evidence or supporting data because I think we can all pretty much agree at this point that the weakest link in the security chain continues to be people. Right? And we've known this for years, it's been true for a long time, and it's still true today. Right? So that's what I'm going to assert, that another unacceptably weak link in the chain is what we're doing about it. Right? For example, take a report from IBM from this year. In a passage talking about threats to the healthcare sector in particular, they say that organizations should focus on educating employees using a variety of approaches and require training at intervals to make the risk clear. And this is actually better advice than most of these kind of reports give out. But if you think about it, there's really no depth to it. It's really just kind of empty. So we know that humans are the weakest link in the security chain, and the only advice we keep on giving out is tell them don't be a weak link anymore, right? If you've got problems with your people, just, just train them better. Cool, right? Uh, but that leaves us with the natural question. When it comes to fixing people, how do we train them better? Of course, the answer I've come up with is, well, let's teach them evil. Of course, it's, it's not at all revolutionary to to teach offensive techniques to would-be trainers. And it's certainly not revolutionary at all to consider that everyone in your org has to be considered a Deventer. That's why all we're really doing, or that's why it's not enough to say that we want to get people to, to do the right thing, because we're already there, right? People already want to do the right thing, and that's part of the problem, right? Bad guys know that people want to be helpful. Every social engineer knows this. That's why confidence tricks work, right? Um, so my concept of teaching evil is about reconceptualizing what the right thing is, right? The core idea is not to motivate people to want to do the right thing. The core idea is to motivate people to want to do the security conscious thing, what we want them to do. Because, of course, if you can do that, you get everything, right? You can have meaningful conversations about phishing and social engineering and secure coding and all of the above. So when I talk about awareness, that's what I mean. It's not just cognizance of a problem, awareness of a problem, instilling us that problem. Hi folks, Iron Geek here. Unfortunately we had an audio problem right about here because the uh, new capture device decided it didn't want to cooperate. So fast forward to about the four minute mark and audio should resume. Sorry for the inconvenience. Maybe we're just not teaching to everyone's understanding. So knowing all of this, I decided to do a little bit of research and come up with a way to help me communicate my message. And what I found and what I based a lot of what I ended up building was based on a white paper from the Maritz Institute entitled The Neuroscience of Learning, A New Paradigm of Corporate Education. And it's full of wonderful quotes that look great on slides, but my favorite is this one. It says, when developing training for business environments, we spend most of our time focusing on the content we want people to learn, or the content we want them to know, rather than how they will learn. As a result, we fail to engage them, fail to keep them engaged, and fail to help them transfer knowledge into action. Now, the good part is that this is in the problem statement at the beginning of that paper, and they do go on to say things like, 
good instructional design can go a long way towards fixing it. And then, of course, there's all that neuroscience that they titled, that they promised in the title, which is really fascinating, but again, I don't have time to get into it. And I want to focus on good instructional design anyway. And in particular, I want to think about what we can do to engage our students, right? What, we, what can we do to keep them engaged and what can we do to help them transfer knowledge? So to solve the instructional design problem and possibly even get back to talking about security, um, I want to take a step back and consider why people learn things. Ask yourself, what o not only what is the goal of learning and why do we learn new things, but why do we teach other people new things? Of course, the answer that I like is to increase a person's knowledge and abilities. Right? So if what we're doing is we're teaching evil, our desire, of course, is that the person whom we're teaching become capable of doing evil things. Right? But more than that, we want them to become capable of recognizing and understanding evil things. And that's what we're looking for. So we know what we're trying to teach. It's, it's security awareness training. And we know that we have to teach it in a certain way to the understanding of our students. The question now becomes, how do we teach this stuff? And we've got a few options. Today, most organizations turn to self-paced computer-based training. Right? Uh, if you're talking about a massive open online course or a webinar or some silly flash thing that you click through and skip until you get to the questions at the end, regardless, I'm going to lump all of that stuff unfairly into the category of CBT, computer-based training. While I generally like computers and computer-based training, I do not like them for security awareness training. I'm going to harp on this for a second, particularly because it's so damn popular to use this stuff for security awareness training. And the popularity is easy to understand. It makes a certain kind of sense. It's very appealing to people whose job it is to track compliance, right? Your HR department, your governance council, your auditors, right? Computer-based training has a lot of things going for it. Right? For starters, it's easy to administer. You give out a link and you get a report back. So we say it's efficient. It's very light on logistics. Everyone's got a laptop. You don't need to book a conference room. So we say that it's flexible. You can buy it off the shelf or you know, off of a website. So we think that it's widely available. So that's awesome. And the incremental costs are very, very low. It doesn't cost any more to deliver it to 10,000 people than it does to 10. Regard, you know, depending on your vendor's pricing model, it doesn't actually cost any more once the training has been produced. So we say that it's really cost effective. Unfortunately, computer-based training doesn't work for the kind of awareness training that I'm talking about. Right? It just doesn't solve the problem that I want to solve. The packages you can buy, and certainly every single one of the dozen or so that I've personally looked at, all focus on knowledge transfer. And they can be very good at that, but they hardly touch skill building, uh, which in general, computer-based training, period, isn't very good at. And while there is a lot of progress towards moving towards artificially, artificial intelligence-based computer-based training, um, the TLDR here is that we're just not there yet. Right, so if computer-based training is off the table, what's left? And of course, the answer is workshops. Right, months to the sort of vocational training that you probably all thought that I would be talking about the entire time if you actually looked at the title of, this, of, the, of the talk. Um, after all, while this style of education is very much oriented around skill building, and that's perfect because I'm going to argue that really that's what we're trying to do is, is skill building. All right, now hopefully I haven't gone too far off the deep end. And you'll remember, I'm really just trying to solve for awareness training, right? And while I'd asked this sort of tactical question earlier, and we went into a little bit about how learning and unlearning may or may not happen, what I haven't yet touched is the concept of motivation. And I do want to talk for a second about motivation, but I don't want to go into, into, into any of the science, so I'm just going to pull out the big gun. Um, if you don't recognize the face, Hopefully this looks more familiar. That's Abraham Maslow, and this is the hierarchy of basic needs. For our purposes, it's enough to know that something on the bottom, more foundational, lower on the pyramid, is a stronger motivator than something higher up. Right? The problem that we have today is that almost all professional workspace training focuses on relatively less prepotent motivators. That is to say, stuff higher on the pyramid. Right? Largely, professional performance enhancement training focuses on your sense of self-actualization, which is what Maslow says is what we can be instead of what we must be. Because, let's face it, from a learner's perspective, the reason that you take professional training is to be better at your job than you can be. And that's absolutely the very top bucket on the pyramid. 
And that's unfortunate, but knowing all of this, we can start to put the pieces together. And we can think about how we might motivate people better. The answer is right there in the title. Evil. In particular, it's an evil trick called bait and switch. Take the very first class that I put together for awareness training, the very first one, when I first started designing classes. It was called Intro to Web Hacking. Just like I put the title, uh, the keyword in the title there, just like I did in my talk, right, hacking, right? The concept of hacking is vague and mysterious. Remember, we're talking about layman here. We all know that the word is horribly overloaded with meaning, but to the layman, learning to hack is an opportunity to learn some mystical dark art. And that fact alone immediately helps you target a motivator that's lower on the pyramid. Esteem. Because this isn't a workshop that you take to be better at your job. Remember, we're talking about layman here. This is a workshop that you take to be cool. And there's no two ways about it. If you're the resident a, a hacker in an accounting department, you're a rock star, right? So that's the bait to get them in the door. Now we have to pull the switch, but we have to do this really subtly. As we start to progress throughout the workshop, what we're going to do is we're going to teach the students how easy it is to be a hacker. And indeed, the basics of something like web hacking are actually pretty simple and can be taught very trivially. In particular, what we want them to do is to learn how realistic the threat is. What we're trying to do here is step further down the pyramid and make the concept of hacking and being hacked more real to the student, more understandable. Because by teaching somebody how to attack a computer system, the goal is to help the student understand how it can happen to them. And that's the switch. We're essentially using fear as a motivator, but only to get them to the point where they ask the big question. How do I protect myself? And indeed, what I found throughout quite a while of teaching this stuff is that the most common follow-up question I get is how do I stop bad guys from doing this? And of course that question is much, much harder, but you can certainly count it as a huge win if you can motivate somebody to get to this point on their own because now they're interested in having the conversation. Now you're not an obstacle anymore. Now they want to think about security and that was the goal the entire time. So how do we facilitate this? How does it all actually work? I've gone through roughly 200 slides, believe it or not, uh, including the background of educational theory and a little bit about motivation, and I can finally answer the question, how do we teach evil? This is the point where I stop lecturing on philosophy and science, and for the rest of my time I start prescribing behaviors. So how do we facilitate teaching evil? Well, the answer that I've come up with isn't revolutionary at all, it's just a blended learning style. I use video lectures, and a more traditional workshop style classroom component that's very, very hands-on. Some amount of lecture is unavoidable, of course, but by very hands-on, I mean roughly 50% lab time. Uh, just remember that we need to maximize the amount of time that the students are given to incorporate the material that they've been given. But if there's a secret sauce, I've already told you what it is. The secret sauce, the most important part, is about getting the students into the right mindset so that they ask that big question, and then you can teach whatever you want and they'll learn it. Okay, remember, the whole time I've only been focusing on awareness, raising awareness and motivating the interest in doing a secure thing. It'd be a shame if you went through this kind of trouble and didn't do further training. Okay, I'm almost done. I do have one further thing to get into, and I do have one big question that I haven't really answered. Imagine at least somebody's looking for it. Can you prove that this has an impact to the business? And the answer is no. <laughs> I have no quantitative data that suggests that my methods contribute to anybody's bottom line. But what I do have is a couple of anecdotes, and I'll share two of them quickly. First, uh, in my very first session, in my very first uh, hacking class, I had a dev who showed up. This was a typical software engineer who was developing JavaScript that had to run in all of the imaginable possible browser environments. And because of that, what his primary focus on was portability. And he developed a technique for debugging which he'd hidden in his code as a sort of backdoor, and it never crossed the guy's mind about the kind of tools and techniques that a hacker might use until he learned to attack his own code and how to discover the vulnerability and how to attack it. And then after a brief period of reflection, we had a major vulnerability remediated that day after a two-hour class. As a second analogy, one of my other classes that I like teaching is sabotaging workplace productivity. I love this topic because it's so damn much fun to teach and watch everyone's eyes get really wide. 
Uh, in my very first session of that class, I had a project manager who showed up and recognized so much of what I said and was so surprised that I was describing known sabbatorial techniques that they started bringing in an overseer to all of their meetings from then on, exclusively to squash time-wasting behaviors. So while I can't explicitly quantify that my methods generate or save dollars, I'm still pretty confident that they do. I've certainly followed up with many of, many of my students and had them tell me that, their that my classes have changed the way that they think about security. And in the end, that's all I was really going for. So hopefully you'll give it a try and meet with more success than I did. And thank you for letting me uh, fill in and putting up with me instead of learning about exploit kits. <laughs> might have time for a question unless they throw me off the stage. No? Thank you. Are you doing any of the other talks? Am I doing any of the